so we discuss about this system console that is our web console so here uh, um, basically we see all our bundles and uh, our bundles should be in active state we can manually stop them and start them whenever we want it but it all depends whether if we do not want any bundle for sure we can stop them but carefully it should be done it like any uh, uh, like out of box AEM provided bundle should not be stopped because in case if you uh, like mis mistakenly stop any uh, necessary or required bundle then it can lead to issues so let me start that uh, our uh, this bundle sample bundle again so now you can see it's in active state back again yeah okay uh, so firstly let's talk about the technology stack but all is there and then we will touch base upon the different thing, uh, different streams. And also we discuss a bit about CRXD light uh, in the last meeting. Today we will more discuss about this and then we will start working with our code base. Okay, so let's start with the, uh, with the uh, technology stack of AEM. Okay, so, okay. so here, here, last time also when we were working on, when we created our project over here, the code base over here and the sample and then inside the code, here we realize that, okay, inside the code for all of our Java files, ultimately a jar gets created. And I said that day as well, that it's not a jar, but it's a bundle. Why do we call it a bundle? And what is the difference between a bundle and a jar? So basically, in AEM, we do not use or we do not create jars, but we create bundles. So bundles is nothing but jar. So it's a jar only, but internally, it contains one additional file, which makes it a bundle. So that additional file is meta INF, meta, meta INF manifest.mf so we got we call it as manifest.mf or meta nf file so this manifest.mf is nothing but which contains information about which contains information about the jar so the jar plus manifest.mf5 is equal to bundle so bundle is nothing but a jar but it also has one additional file that is manifest.mf what this manifest.mf is it is metadata about the jar. So basically it contains the information about the jar. So if I have this jar, I have this JDGUI tool, which is a decomp uh, decompiler through which you can see the code of code inside your jar. So if I uh, tries to open this bundle, here you will see it is basically a jar only. But if I go inside this meta NF, you will see this manifest.mf file. This manifest.mf file is nothing, but it contains the information about the jar. And okay, which all packages are export, which all packages are being exported by this bundle or this jar? What all packages are being required for this bundle to work? Okay. Other things like bundle name, bundle symbolic name, bundle version, and the Java version that it is using, the Maven, everything, basically the information about information about the jar so this manifest.mf is nothing but metadata about jar data about jar okay so in am we make the use of bundles and those are not jars and all those bundles sits in our or we can see actually those from our this web console that is system console okay now, this was the first technology stack. AEM makes the use of these bundles. Now, where does this bundle actually sits inside AEM? So, like in Java, we have the servlet concept and servlets uh, are stored inside container. Similarly, there is a container in AEM as well because AEM also has server within it. So, AEM actually makes the use of OSGI container. So here, this container where our bundle sits is the OSGI container. And within this OSGI container, our all our bundle sits. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so this is our OSGI. 
where all our bundle sits. And the third and the most important technology stack of AEM is, so basically we also call it as Felix container. So basically this is all, this is also our Felix container where, where our bundle sits. And the third, and the third is our sling. So sling is the third and the most important technology stack of AEM. And the work of sling is resource resolution. So to understand what is sling, uh, let me just open a page in AEM. So OSJ is like a server, right? Yes. Uh, so basically it's a container. Mm -hmm. Like we have containerized system like, so it's, it's similarly like a container. It's a container for a, like we have container which holds our servlets. Similarly, like uh, Kubernetes, they work on containers. Similarly, it's a container which contains or which holds or which has, which mm -hmm. holds over all our bundles. And then like bundles, uh, uh, each bundle is a part of the code, right? It's like a snapshot of the code at any given time, right? Yes, exactly. So okay. snap, the bundle is basically the compiled version of all our code base. So it's a snapshot of our code base at a particular time. Mm -hmm. So each time whenever we build our code, what is preferred is that we should keep incrementing the version of our code. Mm -hmm. So like if I go over here, inside the sample code base. And if I open this form, uh, inside my form here, here, here is my version. Like this is my version. This is my major version. And this is my minor version of my code base. So always what is preferable. So see my version is 1.0 minus snapshot. And if you see over here, uh, the sample version is a sample project. It also has the same version 1.0 snapshot. Mm -hmm. so, so from here, the version number got decided and always it is said that ev with every build, your version should get incremented. So this major version should remain the same, but this minor version should get incremented. And like when you are doing some major deployment, some totally some major uh, release, then you're, then you should increment your major version. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So. Here we, if, you, if I open any page, if I open this page, mens.html, so see how AEM gets to know that, okay, if you will hit this URL mm -hmm. on your browser, then behind the scene, there is a resource sitting in AEM and that should be accessed. Like you just showed me that in the browser, in, in, when you were sharing your screen in the browser, yeah. you hit that URL with model.html and ultimately it called you that sling model. So how yeah. does AEM resolve this URL to, to, to the resource that sits within AEM? So that resolution in AEM is being done with the help of Sling. Mm -hmm. so Sling is a technology or you can say Sling is a framework which basically does this resource resolution. Mm -hmm. The mapping of URL to the resource within AEM. So see, the resource within AEM is this. Where is this resource sitting? So here, somewhere within the AEM repository, this resource is sitting. So if I open this, this resource is sitting over here. Inside the content, here is the resource, it is sitting. So how does AEM get to know that when I access this URL, there is a resource within the repository of AEM. This mapping of URL to resource in AEM is done with the help of mm -hmm. link. So Sling does the resource resolution. That is why I put it RR. Here it will do the resource resolution. Yeah. So bundles is the core. Bundles is we bundle is our uh, uh, nothing but jar plus manifest. Manifest is data about the jar. So manifest MF plus jar is our bundle Sling, which does our resource resolution. And then we have our with Felix container or SJ container, which will mm -hmm. hold our code base. Okay. We have our Java content repository, Java content repository. Okay. This is the, this is another important thing. So JCR, 
all the data in AEM is stored in our in a repository which we call it as Java Content Repository (JCR). Mm -hmm. So here you can see ultimately I showed you it was it was stored somewhere over here. I I showed to you like in AEM I went inside here inside the CRX instance. Here we have the repository where it is stored in the form of tars, but ultimately means of course it is stored in the form of tars, but the repository in which the data is stored, we call it as Java content repository, that is JCI. So when we have to insert some data in AEM or whenever we have to read some data in AEM, then the CRUD operations like the create, read, update, delete, the CRUD operations in AEM are being performed on JCI, that is Java content repository. In AEM, the repository is called as JCI, Java content repository, where the data is stored. Like like maybe in the other application, in, in, in simple Java application, we use some database yeah. to store, to retrieve our database, uh, to, to retrieve our data. Maybe a relational database or MongoDB, anything. In AEM, we use the inbuilt JCR, Java content repository, wherever all our data is stored. And it is stored, as you can, as you know, and you can see the data is stored in the hierarchical way where it has a parent to child relationship and each node or each resource like here each this node either we call it as a node or either we call it as a resource mm -hmm. would have a parent and would have a set of children and each node or resource would have a set of properties so if i click on this men's node or men's uh, uh, node or men's resource then it has some properties which has a key and value Okay, so that's how the data is being stored within AEM, which is called as Java Content Repository. Okay, any yeah. any questions, any doubts on this? Uh, so far, okay. Okay, that's uh, Yeah, so we discussed about JCR, Sling, that is our resource resolution. Then we discussed about bundles and our container, Felix container. Okay, let me show you uh, okay, so here, uh, what I what I prefer using is uh, is uh, this uh, IntelliJ. It is a very uh, powerful tool. Uh, here you can easily integrate uh, with other plugins, and uh, like also you can directly communicate with your AEM and Git. Everything can be easily integrated, so it's a good tool. You are using IntelliJ in case if you're using, uh, sorry, Eclipse, then that is also good, but it's all, whichever you want to use, you can use that. Okay. Like here in my uh, IntelliJ, I can include my project that I created by just going into uh, new and module from existing source. And here I can select the module which I wanted to select. So here I have my whole sample project okay so create a module from yes uh, okay maven i will select because it's a maven project okay uh, okay um, sorry. just a minute This way, I am including the sample project into my IntelliJ. So simple, new, and just selecting the module. See, I I could have selected. I have made. I could have made it as a other project. In that case, it could have opened in a separate window altogether. New IntelliJ window. So I just included in one of the existing. Like there, there was a Teams project already, and then I included this sample project. Okay. So here I have all my modules, core, uh, this all core dispatcher, dispatcher we can ignore and like front end also we can ignore. And here we have more form. Okay. Pretty simple. Uh, let's see some of the basic authoring things in AM and then we will start with the component. 
so we discussed about this we discussed about code base deploy deployment we already discussed how will you deploy virtual command we will use auto install by using the necessary profile in case if you face any issue while knowing like what is after minus p like maven clean install minus p then see the best thing is that you can you can go to this readme.md every project would have this readme.md and here would here they have mentioned or here uh, like you would be having all the necessary commands for 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 your aem to be built and deployed so here you can see to build to build all the modules you can run maven clean install if you want if you are running an AEM instance, you can build and package the whole project and deploy into AEM with Maven clean install hyphen P auto install package. Hyphen P is again the profile and those profile would be the code for those profile or the steps for those profile would be mentioned inside the pom.xml, either the parent or inside the UI apps. Okay. Uh, then uh, to deploy it on publish instance, see important thing. Now, this was to only deploy on the author instance. To deploy on the publisher instance, so you can use this command, uh, auto install package publish, or alternatively, you can provide the port. See, how currently we, uh, like, I just ran this command, auto install package with this profile, and how does AEM get to know that, okay, I have to deploy on the port 4502, because my author is running on 4502 and we were able to successfully install the sample project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here, here you can see our sample project was successfully installed. So how, uh, by using this command, our AEM gets to know that, okay, it has to deploy on the port 4502 running on local host. So in the pom.xml, if you would see, there are some properties. Like, let me firstly tell, uh, let me firstly, uh, firstly, uh, I show you the profile and then you, I will show you that auto install yeah auto install package so if you see this profile what it is doing is it is using some command some vault command so vault is nothing but a tool that actually helps us in communicating between our our drive to AEM server. So communication, packaging, and sending the, uh, the 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 code and content back and forth to and forth from uh, from your drive to AEM and AEM to drive is being done by a Vault tool. So this Vault tool, we we use the plugin for that within this within our form. And if you would see here, we what we did is that the target URL is this. HTTP, AEM host, AEM port, and now the CRX pack manager screen. So somewhere, so in this package manager, the zip should get installed. And what should be the host and port? These are the host and port. These, these are dynamic variables and its values are being defined on the top. So you can see the values are defined over here. So in case if your author and your publisher are running on an port other than 4502 and 4503 then better is that you should change those values over here yeah. like okay because all your while deploying while reading all at all the places this is uh, the port and uh, for author and publisher is it is read from here <coughs> okay and similarly, if you want to see the profile for this auto install package published, so here, here in the pom.xml only, the profile here you can see here is the profile. It would be deploying your code into AEM publish port and AEM publish host and AEM publish port. Okay. So AEM actually by default, in case if you even if you do not provide any port, then also it will or it will it will start by itself on the port 4502, the author instance. Okay. Because the first preference for AEM, there is a preference wise for ports. So the first port that AEM looks for, or in case if you do not provide, then it's 4502. If you provide this port, then it's Best in case if you do not provide it, then by default the first preference is 4502. 
in case if uh, 450 is already taken, then there is another list of set of port which which then AEM prefers to look and starts starts on that port. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. So this readme uh, file is uh, sometimes is very useful in the beginning in case if you want to see all the commands that are coming. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's. Okay. Now. One important another thing uh, over here. So we did deploy our code on other instance, but we still have to deploy our code on publisher instance. So to deploy our code on publisher instance, what I will use is sorry, no, sorry, just a minute. It's my command wrong. Yeah. So auto install bundle, auto install package. Sorry. Package publish. I hope this is the correct command. Auto install package publish. So if I will run this command, the code will get deployed on the port 4503 localhost 4503. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, it's it will take its own time. Till then it's okay. We do not need to worry. It's it will deploy the code on publisher. Um, yeah, so till then, let's start with the other things. So here uh, on author, let me just show you some of the authoring things, you know. Uh, okay, so see, this is editor.html. You would see whenever you, you start and edit this edit this page, then, you, then it opens in the editor.html. Here, between this URL after the host port and between the URL and uh, like before the URL, there is this text editor.html comes. So this editor.html is necessary in case if you want to edit on author mode. So for editing this, uh, this uh, text should be there as part of your URL. Okay. So if I, if I see, I told you that what you do is firstly, you create the content then you preview the content and then you give a printout. So how you give the printout or basically how you preview, how you give the publish or transfer the content is by going over here, publish. But there is a step in the middle as well, that is to preview the page before giving the printout. So here is the preview. So in case if you want to see on author how your page is going to look like before giving the publish command, then just click over here. You can see, now you cannot edit and you would be able to see how the things are going to occur. In the same way, like we have this publish, let me go back to uh, edit back again. Okay. And here also these within these three dots, you have this view as publish. This is another mode in which you can see how the page is going to look on the publisher. Instance. So if I click over here, it will take you another uh, tab and here you can see it appended this URL WCM mode is equal to disabled. And here, you can see actually again, you can see like similarly like the like like this icon preview. Here also you can see how the page is actually going to exactly going to look like on author on publisher instance. Mm -hmm. So if you want to end to end test the thing that okay, how your page or uh, is going to look like on the publisher, best is that you use this thing question mark WCM mode disabled. Okay. Yeah. This way, it will give you the page of how it will look like on, how it will look on publisher instead. Okay. This was preview, this is edit. Okay. This is layout. So layout is how your page will look like on different devices. So here, EGM gives you an option that, okay, you have designed your page, you have designed your CSS, JS, everything. And you wanted to see how the things will look like on other different devices. So to, to check the responsiveness of your page, you can go to this layout and then you can select it. Okay, oh, your page on uh, this iPad and Galaxy iPhone is going to look like in this way. Okay. The so layout is this for this. Then you have developer. Developer is important. Developer is basically 
helps you identify the time being taken to load this page. Here you can see, I clicked on the developer and gave me the whole time taken by the page. So this is the whole time taken by the page. And between that, the time taken by each and every component that are there on the page is over here. So the addition of all these will give you this time. Mm -hmm. So in case if you face the issue that, okay, your page is consuming a lot of time. Let me, let me go out of this layout mode by just clicking over here again. Uh, okay, desktop mode, yeah. So desktop. So here, yeah. So here, the developer act mode actually tells you the time being taken by IDO, right? The whole page and each and every component. So in case if you're facing the some performance issue, so this tab or this, this developer console or this developer thing is helpful to know how much time every component is taking, and then you can dig that, okay, oh, this component is taking huge time. Then further, you can analyze why it is taking so much of time. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I will tell you about this copy thing and tar targeting is not important. I will tell you about this time wrap and live copy status, this thing later. When we will cover these topics, then, we, then I will tell you. The editor layout and developer I told you. Plus over here, okay. So this uh, open properties, okay. When we will cover the templates, then I will tell you. Start workflow. When we will discuss about workflow, I will tell you. When we when we will discuss about how what is the purpose of workflow, how you create a workflow, and how you start a workflow on a page and all. So at that time I will discuss this whole workflow thing then. Uh, after, uh, below that we have the log page. This is pretty important. So CM CM uh, guys like uh, who are authoring the page, they actually uh, they what they tend to do is they they make their changes and then maybe they have to get it approved or they may it may take some time for them to complete editing on the page. So between that time to prevent anyone else from editing the same page what authors or what anyone can do is they can go over here and they can log the page so like i am logged in as an admin user for now i was admin user and what i did is i logged this page so here you can see that there is a log icon coming up so in case if this they consider i i as my user i logged into this uh, logged into this console into this instance and into this page and then I log this page so that I do not want anyone else to edit this page. Now this page can only be unlogged by me who logged the page or by the admin user. So admin user has all the privileges. Every privilege is held by admin user. Okay. In case if someone is not able to do any functionality or they have a restriction of accessing anything, it has to be resolved by admin user because admin user will have all each and every rights is being held by admin user. Okay. So now if you want, if you are done, like consider I am done with my work, I can unlock it by just going over here and unlock this page. So currently you, uh, you currently lock this page to pre which prevent others from editing. So to unlock, just click over here, unlock. So now it's unlocked. So anyone else who is coming can perform their editing and their modification. Of course, anyone else, when the page is locked, they can come and see the page, but they cannot modify it. So modification updation is prevented while the page is locked. Okay. So like we have published, similar way we can un unpublish the page. So in case if we want to remove the page from publisher, only from publisher, like consider this men's page is there. And if you do not want this page to appear on publisher, you want to like this page consider is, is stale, obsolete, and you do not want end users to see this page. So what you can do is you can unpublish this page. So this way, the page is still going to remain on author, but will get removed from publisher or basically deleted from publisher instance. Okay. Edit template we will discuss and we'll, we will go to the template thing. Uh, view as published 
I uh, I view as publish. I already discussed with you. View in admin is nothing but it will take you to this console. Like if I click on view in admin, so this page is something. It will take you again to this console. Like see, here it also took me to this console. Okay. Any questions? Any doubts? Uh, so far it's okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay. It's great. And help is nothing but it will give you an information about what all things are there, how you can author, like it gives you tool tips, all these, how you can navigate and all these things. Like for beginners, this can be, this is useful to see uh, what all functionalities are there and how you can perform navigation and how you can you start using this this uh, AM okay. <clears throat> okay so a bit about this was a bit about authoring uh, let me just go back okay over here and uh, let me yeah go Okay, so let me um, briefly tell you some of the links. Um, we discussed about sites and assets. Um, experience fragment, I will tell you later. So once I will tell you, then only I will cover this uh, experience fragment link. So experience fragment, let me give you a brief idea about this experience fragment, but of course later we will co cover it completely. So see, uh, we, why do we create components in AEM? To perform reusability. So like consider we have a website, uh, NetWest, Net, uh, West Bank. Okay. So this is a, a banking website. Uh, okay. So the here we have, okay, just for a time, I want. so here I, we know that, okay, this part, if it's in building AM, so, okay, some component would be used over here to create uh, to create this part of the website. Now, if I scroll down again, you can see the same lookout, same image, and below that there is a text like over here. Here we also we have images, and below that we have text. Now, of course, the same components are being used at diff at multiple places. So the same component would be used over here, and the same component would be used below. It's just that the images and text are different that we can make. Then we get that we can make configurable as part of our component. Now, so basically, what we understood is that components are reusable set of code, which once created can be used at multiple places to display for to to, to display that uh, uh, like uh, content on that part of the page. So it's a usable reusable code. So from code. The reusability is achieved using component and from content reusability is achieved using experience fragments. Okay. So in case authors see that, okay, there is some part of the page, maybe which is, which needs to be created by using collection of components, like consider again on the net this, this website, consider this explore our product and below that you have image and then some text and uh, then maybe some this whole this text you see authors authors or cm team uh, uh, recognize that okay this part of the page which is made using two or three components this same content exactly same content has to be created on 10 or 20 pages now of course it would be very tedious task for the authors to create the same content on all the 10 or 20 pages. So that is why to overcome this problem, to, re to re uh, reduce the redundancy of content, this experience segment has been used. So experience segment is nothing but pages only where you can create your content by using collection of component. And then you can refer or you can uh, refer exactly those experience segment or those pages but you basically we call it as experience segment. So those experience segment on all the 10 or 20 pages wherever you want. So this way it helps us in achieving redundancy of content. Okay. 
we have forms forms is uh, to one create question. Adaptive. sorry sorry one question yeah, so yeah. Uh, like say we create like components with a content inside the experience fragment and then we can use that whole thing like in different pages right yes exactly so oh. by using maybe by using collection of components you create some content and that content then you can use on number of pages Okay, all right. Okay, so reusability of content. Now that content once created within this experience fragment can now be referred or can be used on a number of pages. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Now this forms, forms is, is where we create our adaptive form. So in AEM, as we know, everything is component. So here for create forms also, we use components. So like in simple HTML form, what we use is we create the form from tag. And within that, we have the action attribute. And then between that, between the form start and form end tag, we, what we have is the like input type text or input type radio, input type checkbox, all those things. So those are static HTML forms. Now, AEM makes the use of adaptive forms. So, in adaptive forms, to place a text field, to have a text field in a form, you do not write HTML, but you again, you, you, you make the use of components. So, there will be one text field component, and then the same text field component would be used at all the places wherever we want the text field to be displayed. Okay. So forms again in AEM is built using components only. And these forms are, are is what we call it as adaptive form. Okay. okay. So here we create our adaptive form. So below icons are out of scope. So we won't be discussing this. If I go to the hammer icon, so here all the configuration and all the work, main work is being done. Uh, I would prefer going to these important links or, or the links that are needed. The time we will we will actually get to. So see, here we have the workflow and then we have a lot of options. So once we will cover workflow, then we will discuss about all these things. Operations, again, uh, like when we will discuss the troubleshooting, then we will discuss about these, like logging and troubleshooting, then we will discuss. <laughs> So by the time we will go, we will discuss more about these. Deployment, we have discussed like replication. Okay, just one thing, like here we have the packages. So here it will again take us to the package manager screen. Here you can see, okay. And this thing is, let me just close this. This thing distribution uh, is again replication only. See here we have replication, here we have distribution. So distribution is again, replication only but on adobe as a cloud which is after 6.5 we have adobe as a cloud that we discussed in our first session it's not replication that publish or that transfer or that migrate our pages but the publishing of pages is being done with the help of distribution so here the agent way is not worked anymore or agents are not responsible but it's a q model Q, Q sort of way. Here, like, like I tell you, I give you a brief idea. It's just simple. Like for replication, it was the responsibility of the agents on author to publish the page or publish the content on all the publishers. So in case if there are three publishers, so we need to have three uh, agents. But in, with on Adobe as a cloud, which follows the distribution model. So here, it's a pub, it's a pub sub mechanism. So all what all the publishers who have subscribed to receive the notification, they will they will have to subscribe or they they only will receive the published content. So it is now not the responsibility of authors to make sure that the content has been replicated to all the publishers, but it is the responsibility of publishers to subscribe so that they should receive the published content. Behind the scenes, see, from, from our point of view, nothing has been changed. It's just the terminology. 
that from replication it is not distribution but behind the scene the way in which it works it has been changed so prior it was it was the responsibility of agents and author on agents on author were responsible for making sure that the content get migrated but now going forward in distribution it is the responsibility of publishers so that they should subscribe and receive the notification or receive the updated content okay. it's like the cloud uh, things like sns and those kind of things right yes the cloud adobe cloud yeah. okay okay um okay let's discuss about the security uh here we will create our users and our groups so let's briefly uh, quickly create a user and create a group and assign a user in a group and then we will give a permissions to that group so that yeah okay so let me create a user uh let me use the username as sample user okay pretty simple so what i did is i went inside the user and i clicked on create to create any new user so i told you from crx fixed uh the crx g perspective where our users and groups are below the home hierarchy so will the home hierarchy are the users stored so in case if i create a new user like sample user okay and let me give it a password sample okay 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 and let me just okay give it a give a first name sample sample actually like a uh, system user or no these are simple users not oh. system user the so system users you have to create through code from code you can create system user or there is another way through which you can get system user the so system user has a different purpose mm -hmm. they have all together different purpose of creation okay okay are you aware what is the purpose of using system users uh system users i i actually like i create for authors in our company like uh okay. yeah and then like say one more purpose also uh like we have this workflow that it gets the like excel file and it create like resource out of that excel so it somehow um we need to create a system user so wow. and then, um and oh, yeah. use it in the uh, sling uh, mapping Things. Yeah, I don't know uh, where I do. Yes, yeah, like that, that um, um, uh, service user mapping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you that one also. Maybe when we go to workflow, then. Okay. Uh, no, it's not related to workflow. I tell you, what is the purpose of system user? So see, in AEM, while we are executing code, the code is executed by default as the user you are logged in. So here. Mm -hmm. if you see that i am logged in as an admin user yes. so if i am performing any function here i am performing any function then i will be performing with the privileges of admin user okay so admin user admin users has all the privileges like create deletion and all so in case if any code that is getting executed that will get the default privileges of the user who has logged in so as of now consider i am a, like i am an admin user over here and i have the privileges on all the nodes so in case if any operation is taking place which is uh, uh, writing some uh, writing or writing some uh, uh, properties on this etc node somewhere in the etc design node okay yeah. so i am an admin user so of course i have a privilege to write over here but consider instead of this admin user i am logged in as some other user like sample user and sample user consider does not have the rights to to perform the right operation on this design node so when the code will be executed when i am logged in as a sample user it will take the privilege of that sample user and since sample user does not have the privileges to write on this design node so the code will fail mm -hmm. yes okay 
Exactly. Now, where does service user comes into picture? Now, to answer this, see, this is the story of our author instance where we can log in either as an admin or as a particular user. But what about publisher instance? On publisher instance, we do not log in because the end user, of course, does not have any user ID associated with it. Yes. Any user can come and can hit our website. So yeah. during that time, when our code will be executed, what privileges it will get? Okay. Yeah. That time, there is a default user that comes out of box with AEM that is called as anonymous user. So any user, end user that lands on our website, they by default get the privileges of anonymous user. And when the code execute, it will take the privileges of anonymous user and accordingly it will perform the operations. Okay. Now consider that we that anonymous user, of course, does not has the privileges to write something in our CRXD because in case if then any the anonymous user would have some privileges then any end user can come and can write anything can do anything on the, in our repository that is of course a vulnerability of course that is not allowed mm -hmm. so in case if we want to perform some write operation in our in our jcr java content repository or basically our repository for that since anonymous user cannot perform any write operation, so that is why we create a service user and then we assign some privileges to that service user and then we execute the code by reading the privileges of that service user. Mm -hmm. In that case, if the code will be executed, then it will take the privileges of for the that. service user. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for that time. Exactly, for that time. Yeah. Do we call it service user or system user? It's Either you can call it a service user or system user, both are same thing. Okay. Uh, like like now it's for example for us it's it's calling like data, for example. And then in the code it's referring to that actually. Like uh, yeah, I can yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. So here we are not getting service user or system user, these are simple users of how, like the way they will log in into the sites and how we assign the permissions and privileges to the user. So here we created a sample user, we assigned the password to them and it's pretty simple. Let me save it. Yeah, you can see my user is created. And now if I go back again, so this is a, sim a system user that has been created. Now if I go back to security and then groups. Now a group can have is a collection of users or a collection of groups as well. So a group can, can have multiple child groups as well. So what is the purpose of group is that in case if you have hundreds of users and you have to assign privileges to hundred of users, it's not necessary that you go to each and in every hundred user and you assign the privileges to each one of them. But what you do is you assign the privilege to a group and then make all those 100 users as the child of that group. So any permission changes, any privileges changes that is being assigned to, to, uh, uh, to that group will automatically get assigned to all the users within that group. So that is the purpose why we create groups in AEM. Okay, so like if I create a sample group, it's pretty simple. And I, I gave it a name and also I can give it a, a name over here. I give it an ID and here is the members option. So which all will be the child users or child groups for this new group that we are creating. So to give the child uh, uh, user, then the user that we created was the sample user. So here you can see the sample user automatically came up. And let me just save it over here. Okay. So the new user, uh, so the new group has been created uh, with the name sample group. Now we have our user created and we have our group created. Now we can assign the privileges to either that user or to that 
whole group so that all the users within that group will get the same privilege. So here you can search the user or you can even search the group. Like if I search the group, that was sample group. Yeah, here I have the sample group and it is saying one member. So as of now, you can see where this group has been created. It has been created at this path, home groups, W within this. So if I go inside the CRXD, just let me refresh this home hierarchy and home group and then W and okay, you can see here is our sample group. And within this, if you would see, it would have a child that is sample member somewhere, maybe over here. Sorry, how did you find it under W? See, here here we have this, huh? the path on which it has Oh, been yeah, paid. the path. Oh, sorry. Okay. So, okay. so it starts with W, so it's come under W. So home groups, W, mm -hmm. then some random name, number, name, yeah. Now, as of now, this user has been created, this group has been created. The only thing left is to assign the privileges so that this user can work or can log in by its own. So here, if I go and assign the privileges, let me say it has all the privileges like slash content, okay, on all, and all the whole content hierarchy and the permissions is all. So you can either give specific permission, like some read permission, okay, read permission on this hierarchy. So it will only have the read permissions. Or if you want to do some modify permissions, then, okay, these are the modify, like modify properties or anything. So if you want to give all the permissions, then just write all. Okay, on this node, I wanted to give all the permissions and just add it. The same way if you want to uh, give some other permission, like on, um, on simple apps hierarchy, can I give okay? No, uh, on this on okay. So I gave the permissions over here. Let me just give it on slash apps as well. Okay, so this way, what I did is I gave these many permissions to the sample group. And automatically, the child user of this group, that is the sample user, will automatically inherit all those permissions. So if I am over here, if I log out, log out, okay? And then if I try to log in back again, and it was sample user, and I gave it a password as simple. Let me see if I'm able to. Okay. So somewhere permissions are still not fully assigned. Let me just see. Now, if I go back over here, uh, the security, the permissions. Okay, let's do one thing. Let's uh, do it in an easy way. Let me again go back to security and let me make it a child of admin. So here, if I search admin is greater, okay, where is administrator? Yeah. Here we go, yeah. And it has some members. Let me make sample group also as the child of this. It will get all the privileges of administrator. Yes, it will get all the privileges. And now, if I will log out from here, sign out, and now again sign in, sample user and sample. I think I with the password, what was the password? Sample user and yeah. Okay, so I'm now able to log in. You can see I'm able to log in as the sample user where the name, first name, and last name is sample. Okay, pretty simple. You can create the users also. 
so this is a manual way of creating the users but with aem you can also integrate with with ldap like like active directories that is ldap or other active directory like azure or other thing we, through through that way the users and group will automatically get synced into aem yeah okay. that is another way See, this is of course a way but it's a manual way that for just for knowing purpose it is necessary how could you create it but there is an automated way where you can integrate if your company manages some active directory then you can even integrate your aem with that active directory Uh, can I ask you one thing? Uh, there is this uh, link that is like uh, after the local host four five zero two dash user admin. So that's the same thing, right? With this one that you just exactly, wrote. exactly. Okay. So let me also tell you about that. That is actually classic UI. So see, uh, I tell you the history of that a bit, and then we'll show you that thing uh, that user admin as well. so here these all where 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 we are working these are all touch ui screens we call it as touch ui earlier prior to 6.0 when it was days company which was handling it it was there were other set of screen through which you perform all these functionalities like here we have this welcome Sorry, not welcomer but only welcome so this welcome screen like we have this screen so in the same way in classic ui this is a classic ui mm -hmm. like we have many tools like salesforce also has a classic it's some it's simple it's the difference in the ui rest all is same all the things that you can do with touch ui you can do it with sorry all the things that you can do with the classic ui you can do with touch ui but all the things some of the thing that you can do with touch ui you cannot do with classic ui this is because prior to 6.0 it was all classic ui so all the new features all the new functionalities were being introduced in the classic ui but the main issue with classic ui was that authors and cm team could not use the classic ui on their mobiles and on their ipads tablets mm -hmm. it cannot be they cannot author the things over there so to overcome that problem aem comes up with the touch ui screens and with touch ui all the newer features like here you can see experience fragment is a newer feature that was introduced after 6.0 so this new feature experience fragment was only brought inside touch ui and was not never ever a part of classic ui so see websites where again you see all your pages digital assets is this tab assets yeah sites is this similarly users you can see users if i go on user you can see user admin hmm. so all the screens are same but every new feature that aem is bringing is inside the touch, touch ui mm -hmm. classic ui is not being used so here you see here i have an inbox any operation that is being performed if, in case if you have to be notified then those informations come as part of this inbox so here you can see this is view if i do click on this bell icon and if i like here in sentence here you can see it it gave me my mailbox an aem mailbox and the same mailbox can be accessed over here inbox and here also you will be able to see all those things so here we have how many four and here also you can see all the same it's just the look and feel is different and it's deprecated mm -hmm. got it actually till 6.5 we can even open these screens but on adobe as a cloud we cannot even open the classic ui screen mm -hmm. they have even they have totally deprecated it for me it's bad because i get <laughs> used to the classic yeah yeah i don't actually, know what the I... people like for me also uh like i am more fond of classic and more used to but now yeah. it's an history but it's history and uh, not being used or not 
mm. being preferred by actually adobe don't even provide the support of these anything if fails oh. uh, anything not working they do not even provide the support even if you raise a ticket with them they always say move to touch why we we have stopped the support for these oh, okay. that's bad yeah <laughs> Because uh, sometimes I have like uh, sessions with our authors, so I want to like teach them some components how they need to configure it. And then, for example, I open the class view, and then they say, "Okay, what is this?" <laughs> and I would say, "Okay, okay, let me open the the other uh, view." And then when they open that, I open that one, and they say, "Yeah, okay, okay, <laughs> we understand now." But I would suggest you to start uh, making your authors more familiar with TouchWay because any day uh, they can totally remove it from any of their version. Yeah, the authors. Yeah, the authors use that one. Yeah, the authors use the other. Yeah. The TouchWay one. Yeah, the TouchWay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Then it's good. Then it's good. Then then it's for you. You should start using. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, Because see, on Adobe as a cloud, it's you cannot even access this. Like this welcome screen, mm-hmm. if you will hit it, it, uh, it is not accessible. It give you a blank page. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, this was about the classic UI and touch UI. Like everything that we have on touch. on classic we have it on touch but everything on touch is not there on classic because all the newer features are every new thing has been brought inside the touch screen not in the classic ui okay like you have this uh, this users inbox tagging everything would be over here as well like here you can see you have the tags here. yeah i always reach them with the ui i mean the url <laughs> Yeah, 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 I think that's why we get used to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Ah, uh, let's start. Ah, uh, any any questions? Any doubts till now? You have. Um, just one more thing. I just want to double confirm. Ah, uh, so the the thing ah uh, that I asked you that that I think it will be called like service builder. Which sorry, come again. The one that you were explaining to me that uh, for uh, any modification on JCR, uh, the uh-huh. yeah, so that kind of user that we create that services will use, we will call it like service user. Yes, right? yes, okay. yes, exactly. So and the uh, is like a system user. Ah uh, yes, yes. So let me just show it to you also inside CRX. Uh, Uh, explorer yeah so here if you go to this screen crx explorer so this is another screen here mm-hmm. if you go to user admin mm-hmm. and here you can create a user when you start creating a user uh sorry see here you start creating system user so here you get the option of create user and create system user so here you will it will not ask you for the password because system user are not to be logged in into the system they are just so that you can use this user in or in your code and you just assign the privileges to them and they cannot be used to log in into your system they can only be used within your code so that they have so that you can access your code with certain privileges which Which all privileges these users have? Okay, okay. got it. So it's yeah. not that yeah. So it's not that they have some user ID and password. It's just that they have a unique ID that is user ID, mm-hmm. and you assign privileges to them. Like let me assign it. Let me create a system user, a sample system. Okay, and just let me save it. Okay, so yes, it's done. And if I close this, if I go to my in uh, the security again, and uh, users, okay, and again search for sample minus system. Uh, here we have our system user. 
and if i open it over here somewhere you can see it also get created below the home user system and maybe uh, yeah you can change it and if i yeah it's all like now it's a system user and if you have to further give it some privileges again you can go to the okay just let me get back you can again go back to security and permissions and search for that user and its sample system. Yeah. So here you can see even the icon is different. Yeah. Because this is a system user. And now you can. Give. It's, it's like we're creating a user for the service. Yes, we are creating a user for, for our service. Yeah, okay. Exactly. I didn't know this one, uh, yeah, until I got an error and then I, I went and I read about it. It was so confusing, but then, yeah, somehow I understood. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So see, uh, again, I tell you, mainly when we, okay, let me firstly show you, uh, I think they recently put this one, right? No, no, no. It's it's, it's very been... old thing. Oh, okay. Because see, uh, prior to this, what we used to do is that on publisher, whenever a code is executed, and in that code, if we want to perform some modification or read operation, then always what we do is we get the privileges of administrator user, and then we perform the functionality. <laughs> Okay, that is not a good way because admin has all the privileges. So in through in that means we can we can do anything our in our code and anything can be done or anything can be deleted or could be done through our code. So that is if, if some malicious user gets an access to our system, they can execute that code in a in a wrong way and it could hamper or harm our system. Mm -hmm. So that is why instead of using the administrator user, we start using the system user and provide only that privileges where we want to perform some operation. Like consider if we want to perform some operation on the ETC or RKS part of our code. So we will only give the permission to the ETC or, or maybe let's consider that some data is coming from an API and that data we want to store in the where hierarchy. Then that system user will only have an access to our where hierarchy and no other hierarchies. Yeah. Okay. Because by default, if we do not use or in our code, we do not say that, okay, work as system or this, this particular system user, then it will work as an anonymous user. So here we have this anonymous user. Yeah. See, here we have this anonymous user that is by default a part of our code base. Mm -hmm. And if I show you the privileges that it has, it has very limited privileges. So, and you will see it won't, it won't have any right permissions. So if I, if I go over here, so you can see it does not even have any privileges. Yeah. Okay. So that's the thing. That is why we create system users. Assign that only privileges which we, where we want to perform some operation, and using that system user, we execute a code. Okay. Okay. So while performing some read uh, modification or deletion operation, we actually firstly get the session of our system user, and using that session, we then perform the operations. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. And then how we uh, map this one inside the uh, in, inside system console. So we need to map this one, right? Exactly. So uh, actually what happens is uh, we create a system user, but we have to tell where all or which all in, in which all code base we can use that system user. So what we do is we do a mapping of our package to that system user that okay this is the package like the whole package or maybe 
like your initial package name, and then is equal to system user. Let me just show it to you one. So that way, it actually, we tell that okay, within this package only we can use the system user. So it's not that everywhere that the system user can be used, but within the limited packages. So if I go to system console, oh, okay. Since I'm not an administrator because I logged in as a sample oh, user, okay. that is why I can't. Have it. Yeah. So this system console is can only be logged in by the admin user. So let me. Mm -hmm. Login with admin. Okay, there is some issue. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And let me log in with admin. Okay, and let me refresh it over here. And here you can search the configuration. I hope you already know about OSJ configurations. Maybe. I hope. Yeah. So here we have our user mapping, user mapping. So here you can see all the out of box mapping. So here you can see one of the mapping, like this is the mapping, which says that this is the package where this is the system user that can be used. And this is the name which you should use in your code to refer the system user. Okay. Like if I open this, uh, so see, uh, sub service name and then username, uh, principal name, uh, bundle ID. So see, this is the package name. It says that this is a package within which you can use this this system user, mm -hmm. and then this is the actual actual system user. So if I search this system this over here, then I should find yeah. yeah. Uh, not this, sorry. Is this the name of the system user? Uh, I think yeah, it's that one. Okay. Yeah. So this is the so this is the actual name, and this is the name that we can use in our code base to refer the system user. Mm -hmm. This is like this. In the code base to refer the system service user. name, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This is the subservice name. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's how we do. So this ranking is being used in case if there is a if there is a same like this package is being referred over there or consider <coughs> there is another configuration where the mapping is like till this path. Okay. So both both will get matched because this is also the package that will be get matched. That will get mad, and this still core will also get mad. So rest depends upon the ranking. Which one will have the higher ranking? Uh, they will get the preference. 